All right, so on that note, we do have the next panel ready to go. Um, we'll be around for any questions, and of course, anybody coming to the open house, feel free to um, ask us you know, anything. Um, we'll be there. Um, but we've got a great panel coming up now. Um, it's the keynote panel for the day um, that's on suicide prevention policy at the state and local level. Um, and we've got two awesome state representatives here, um, Tina Orwell and Steve Ellison, along with our esteemed um, Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Christine Moutier, and of course, Nancy Farrell, the chair of our board. So enjoy. Good morning, everybody. How are you? Good. good day yesterday? Yeah, good, good. Pumped up to go home and do the same thing at home, right? <laughs> so that's what we're here for this morning. Um, first, let me just thank you all again for how wonderful you were yesterday. Somebody commented to me on the quality of the people at AFSP, and I said, that's my family, of course. They are wonderful people. So, so thanks so much again. So you met um, Tina and Steve briefly last night, but let me remind, remind you that Steve is a representative in Utah. He's been in the House of Representatives for six years. Yes, Utah. It's going to be very hot this weekend, I saw on the Today Show in Utah. So. Um, and Tina Orwal, Orwal has uh, been a representative since 2009 in the state of Washington. And so without further, and their bios are on the la last page of your packet, so please uh, uh, check them out. Um, what they're going to, what I've asked them to do is tell us a little bit um, in introducing themselves why they were interested in suicide prevention and education and what they did about it. And then Christine will talk about um, how their activities fit in with our program and our education and, and training efforts. And then we'll talk a little bit more and then get your questions and comments. Because what we want to do as a result of this panel and some of the breakouts this afternoon is to motivate you, if, if this hasn't happened already, to start working um, on advocacy in your communities and at your state level. And if you already are, we want to give you some tips from some pros who've been pretty successful at this um, so that we can um, advance our issues at the state level as well. Because as you know, we have to do this everywhere and every day. So Tina, could you start for us, please? Yes, um, I'm Tina Orwal. I have the honor of representing my community in Olympia, Washington. Um, I have been in the legislature for eight years. Uh, about four years ago, I started working on suicide prevention. Um, I was approached by a woman named Jen Stuber, and she was a professor at the University of Washington, and her husband had taken his life by a firearm. And she approached me with Sue Eastgard, who is one of our trainers. She's actually a national trainer on suicide prevention. And they started talking to me about doing a training bill um, that would really train professionals. And you know, I was so struck at the time. One, I think they approached me because of my background as a social worker. But the courage that Jen had to come forward after just losing her husband um, was just so incredible. And I think that's why it's so humbling to be here, because so many people are here to help others. Uh, it also, as someone who is a mental health professional, I know I had received very limited training in this area. And what really struck me as we started looking at this is sometimes you get training as a mental health professional around some screening and crisis work, but not around the treatment and management of someone who really is suicidal. And so we kind of started with a bigger, bolder move, which is um, requiring that all mental health professionals and frontline staff actually have a certain amount of training. And we decided a six-hour intensive training is where we started. And it was interesting, and I was just talking to Steve, you know, start with a, a mandate, a lot of people said, why? You know, why would you start with something? And I, and I said, you know, if someone has the courage to ask for help, I want to make sure they get the help they need and deserve. And so, and you know, as we started working on this issue, it really became apparent to me that people I work with in Olympia, they've been impacted by this as well. You know, not only were we hearing these powerful stories from the community, and we do have one of the higher rates of suicide and teen suicide, but from members, members who had lost loved ones, and, and sometimes people are overwhelmed, like, what do we do? And I think working on this issue, there's nothing that's more urgent or more important for me to work on, and there's so much next steps. We've passed um, six bills in the last five sessions related to suicide prevention. Um, you know, the first one probably was the, the most historic. I think we were fortunate we had a lot of agreement from social workers and psychologists on the training before we went in. 
Um, what happened in the health care committee on the House side was they decided that they would um, require doctors and nurses, and we hadn't had them at the stakeholder table. That was a future step. And um, all of a sudden, it went from an agree build to um, the American Medical Association and the psychiatrist did an alert against the bill. And so we ended up kind of with a more challenging first year. What we ended up doing is going back to the origin, which was mental health professionals uh, being trained. And we didn't get that through. And we came back two years later, and we got the requirement for medical staff. Um, it took us a couple years, but we got there. <laughs> So I really see in Washington that, you know, really by coming together as a team, we started with kind of a big, bold move, and we're just seeing more and more success. And it really is that team that has come together to take this on from the community to legislators. And so I'm really excited to be here today to talk about that. Thank you, Tina. So I think we'll come back to that stakeholder issue. And, and Steve, I know you're probably going to talk about it because uh, I've heard a little bit about what you're going to say. Yeah, thank you. So. Uh, the way I got involved with it was uh, in my local middle school where my children went, we had three children in one year die by suicide. And at the time I was serving as a, a scoutmaster in my community and one of the boys in my troop uh, looked at me with this really scary look that said, Steve, people are dying in my school and nobody's talking about it. And I in my mind thought, you know, this boy might be next. And so I contacted the principal and I said, what, what are you, you know, thinking about how you're going to respond to this, uh, these tragedies? And the, the, t the principal, Mary Anderson, later went on to become the middle school principal of the year in our state, uh, created a, a youth protection seminar where they invited parents to come to an activity at the school um, on a, just a school night and they had different modules on suicide prevention, bullying, depression, um, things like that that were very relevant. And I attended that session and it was, it was fabulous. And I met one of the parents of the, that had lost a child uh, that year and he, he pleaded with me to do something about uh, this epidemic and so I, I committed to him that I would. Um, we're, that was about six, six years ago, and that we've passed almost a dozen bills uh, since then. Uh, we still have a, a lot of work to do, but um, as I got into it, I thought, well, this is a complicated subject. You know, it's uh, um, multifactorial, and as you really start digging into it, it's like, wow, this is going to be difficult to tackle, but I started to realize, wow, there are solutions that work. Um, I did a little research and found that there was a, a, a man in our state, state named Dr. Greg Hudnall who had been a middle school principal and had had to go out and identify a, a, a body on the playground for a child who'd taken his life. And he says it was a beautiful child. And he said I was, ever since that happened to him, he was dumbfounded about why somebody would do this and set out on a life mission to try to change it. So he has a group called Hope for Utah. And he put a program in place in his district, Provo School District, um, and after he'd done that, for nine years, they had no suicides in their school district. So I, I met Greg for breakfast. <clears throat> I, I, I met Greg for breakfast, and he said, you know, Steve, you're kind of an answer to my prayers because we've done this in our district, but I want to see it go statewide. And so I sponsored a bill that provided, um, re required districts to have a program, but didn't tell them what program they had to choose and we provided some funding to help get the programs going. And now we have these programs and other programs, because there's lots of good programs um, in a lot of our schools and it's gaining huge momentum. And so we're starting to see some of the, some of the fruits of our labor. We still have a, a long ways to go. So that's kind of how I initially got involved. So Christine, before I turn to you, I think I want to ask, um, in, in putting together uh, coalitions or the groups, if Tina, you talked to this a little bit already, um, was it difficult? Did you target people? Did people come to you? How did you choose to put together both um, perhaps the private stakeholders and your colleagues in the legislature? Well, in Washington, I teamed up with the University of Washington uh, Forefront, which was an organization that was started after the first bill. You know, it's hard to pass legislation, but it's even harder to implement it. And so we needed a lot of partners at the table. And 
we really, for each bill, we've really tried to tailor the stakeholder group. We've had a core set of um, professionals and advocates, a lot of survivors that have really been there for every bill. And so I think part of it is figuring out who needs to be at the table. I can tell you with the work we've done on the training requirements, one of our most important partners were veterans and veterans mm -hmm. groups. And so we really sat around thinking who are our allies, who cares about this issue, um, and the, the group we started uh, recently, and Steve and I were talking about, is around safer homes, where we needed new partners around lethal means. Mm -hmm. So we had to bring the pharmacies, uh, NRA, the Second Amendment. And so we, we grow our group as we kind of tackle different issues and make sure the right voices are at the table. The more you do before you introduce a bill, the greater chance of success. And um, we actually, once we had the group established, people were hearing about it, emailing me, like, can I join? And I was like, yes, of course. <laughs> so it just kept growing. And I think as you end up moving legislation forward, and we also, in the third bill, we did a statewide plan, is people can kind of see, boy, they're getting stuff done. You know, there, there's a movement here, and they want to be part of it. And so I think it's grown over time. Uh, I think our latest stakeholder group where we had um, the NRA and the gun responsibility groups, we're still working on that. They're a little contentious with each other. And, you know, I really believe that um, there's so much common ground and there's so much healing we can do as a country and a community by coming together on these difficult issues. And suicide prevention is that common ground. In Washington, in Seattle, 80% of all of our gun deaths are suicides. And when people started realizing that, they're like, you know, we need to be working on this. And so the stakeholder group is, is our core. It gives us that marching order to go into that next session of what we're gonna do and what the strategies are. And we've invited a lot of members that, um, that I serve with that have really become champions as well. And so we just keep growing that group. Steve. So coalition building is critical. Um, we have a, our, the speaker of our house uh, in Utah has a saying that perfect is the enemy of good. And sometimes you start out saying, well, this is exactly what I want and this is the way it has to be. But in this process, I found that if I'm not willing to compromise, then, and, and I just, I only want perfect, then I'm not even gonna get good. So um, I'll, I'll give you an example. So this um, uh, first bill that I ran to create these youth protection seminars, uh, voluntary for parents to go to, but mandatory for districts to put on. Um, it was gonna be a mandate and it was, um, uh, the, the bill didn't get passed. I won't go into the details, but I came back the next year and said, okay, um, it is voluntary. Well, actually it's mandatory, but you can opt out all you need to do is have the superintendent right. write a letter that these are not issues in our district. <laughs> so, so, suffice it to say, of the four years we've been doing it with our 41 districts, nobody has opted out for even one year. So that was kind of that balance where I really wanted to be a 100% mandate, but I was like, okay, there's room for compromise. In terms of coalition building, um, the area that we've been working on lately is around means matter. Um, I, I think Kathy Barber was here yes. um, yep. on Sunday from Harvard, yep. Harvard School of Public Health. She's been a huge uh, resource to us. And one thing that Kathy has emphasized is that when you look at groups that are very pro Second Amendment and groups that are very pro gun control, um, if you were to put the ball into two big circles, they actually overlap in this oval of the culture of safety. So I found that in this area that if you operate within that little oval of, of common ground, as Tina mentioned, you will find success. If you wanna live on the fringes, then <laughs> you're probably not gonna be as successful. So um, I worked with some of our, our top uh, gun lobbyists in our state, educated them about the issue that just, I think in Utah, our number is closer to 86% of all firearm deaths are suicide. And really, from a kind of Second Amendment perspective, if you change the dialogue, that it's kind of not like the wild, wild west with just people going around, you know, shooting each other. It's really, sadly, you know, people using firearms on themselves. And that that's something that we can do, do something about. When, they, when, they, when that message resonated with them, they became our top ally. 
And interestingly, um, we have implemented a voluntary firearms instructor, a, a new section in our uh, firearms instructor training um, about suicide prevention. It didn't, didn't take a government mandate. They realized that, hey, if we cooperate, we don't need to fear, you know, maybe some draconian mandates that may be coming our way. So education, talking with groups, actually listening, you know, God gave us two ears and one mouth for a reason. Um, and getting that stakeholder feedback and then looking for common ground is how we found success. I think it sounds great. Um, and I love the superintendent line. That's terrific. Um, I'm going to seal that one. <laughs> um, Christine, we've talked about statewide suicide prevention, education and training for um, parents, faculty, um, gun safety. Could you comment on what those mean in, term, in AFSP terms? Sure. I mean, these three areas that it seems like you all <laughs> became knowledgeable about quite by your own interactions and observations um, and by people coming to you and sharing their concerns, which I want to emphasize for us as advocates that that actually makes a big difference. Those three areas are key areas for us. So in the, in the, on the topic of schools and suicide prevention, that's obviously been something that we have been doing as an organization for a long time. Um, public education, education in the schools, and really with our More Than Sad program, getting education out for staff and teachers as well as for teens. And now we have the parent um, module as well. Make sure you all know that, that we have a parent version of More Than Sad now. Um, so that's been longstanding. I think when it comes to clinician training and firearm safety, clinician training and mental health professional, um, physicians, and all the rest of the healthcare disciplines, we, as an organization, have been very interested and involved, and more at the request when clinicians and healthcare groups have been ready for it, we've been able to provide that for them, and, and a small cadre of us have been doing that probably for some years. But our next step is actually to take it on in a much more serious way, to scale it up. Um, a lot of changes are happening in the world around suicide prevention in the healthcare systems, and AFSP is well poised to be a resource to create something that could be um, a highly utilized module for education on suicide prevention across many disciplines. So that's coming um, in the next year. We're, we're very committed to that. Firearm safety is another high interest of ours. And I think we have, exactly like you described, Steve, come upon the way that is a common sense and workable model. It's very, I think, very smart. And that is around firearm safety. And in our conversations so far with firearm owners and retailers and even some of the associations, um, just great common ground with that. So it really fits perfectly, actually, with, with where we are as an organization. Um, I just also wanted to say that you two are truly amazing. It, it amazes me that you came upon that much knowledge about our complex issue and have done so much work already. And I know that you've been working with some of our people, but, but this is, um, and I just have to say, I, I personally was blown away by that, that um, you are real people with real interests that and when it makes sense for your communities, you're gonna do something about it. And I'm just, I'm inspired by that to feel like my own um, local policymakers and, and legislators are approachable in that way. So anyway, I, maybe later we can spend a little more time on how to do that. Because I, I think for me as a general citizen, I really haven't known how to do that, how to approach. Well, so I thought what we'd do might, next might be to talk about what your next steps are going to be or what you're thinking about doing. Um, it is being live streamed, so. <laughs> um, but, and then go back to the whole, if I'm coming to the state house in my state, what should I do to prepare? But what do you think, what are you thinking about doing next? I know it gets harder as you get further along the pipeline. Well, I think it was helpful for our state because we did develop a pretty comprehensive um, plan to prevent suicide, and so there's a lot of steps. Um, Sometimes you start a step and there's still so much to do. And so some of the work I'll be looking at for next session is um, around higher education. Mm -hmm. um, higher ed has two at-risk group. They have young adults um, that are at high risk. They also have a lot of veterans. And so we started, um, I had a bill, I guess it's been a year and a half, two years, 
that had all of our higher ed to start talking about. A lot of it really didn't know what was going on on campus. They couldn't tell you how many um, students took their lives or tried to take their lives. They couldn't really say how much counseling was available. So we've been gathering all that information to go back the next session and say, what do we need to be doing at our higher ed? And I was talking to a young man last week, and he, um, is a, he serves in the military, and he says, I go on any base, and there are posters everywhere about this issue. Are you depressed? Do you need someone to call? You can walk on any of the college campuses in Washington State, and you're not going to see that, right? But yet we have so much need and so many um, young adults in crisis. And so, so that's going to be one of the next things we tackle, is really what can we be doing on all our college campuses? We also did some work on um, the K-12 system, and we're going to go back and try to build on the work. So we required certain educators to receive training, uh, the counselors, the social workers, um, the psychologists. We'd like to go back and do more extensive training with the teachers and the parents, so that will be one of our next steps. The other thing, and another high-risk group we are going to be working with is the tribes. Um, we have a very high rate of suicide of Native Americans, and so we're going to be meeting with the tribes and really say, what, how can we partner with you? What, what are some of the next steps we can be doing? Uh, and again, you know, there's always um, more training, like this last year, we required pharmacies, right, to, to have to put up posters and do training. And one of the stories I was going to share with you is um, I remember when we first did the bill to train uh, the medical professionals, every group came to me and said, do I need to be part of it? So I had the chiropractors, I mean, every group, surgeons, can you exempt me? You know, that, I still hear that, can you exempt me? And the other day, I got this email from the state chiropractors, and a, a gentleman who's a chiropractor had written in, and he said, I was really angry when you passed this legislation. You know, I thought this was really a waste of my time. And so I went to the training, and it, it was actually pretty good. And he said, um, within a week, he got a call from his son in college in Florida who was depressed and suicidal. And he said, I knew what to do and my son's home safe, and it wouldn't have been for that training, I'm not sure he would be. And so, <laughs> so it's, it's hearing those stories of the difference that the work you do makes that I think gives us momentum to keep moving forward. That's great, Tina. Steve? Yeah, um, <clears throat> so one thing that uh, I was the house sponsor of two, two years ago, was an app, um, not that you're gonna be able to see it here, but I'm gonna pull up on my phone, uh, called the UT Safe, Safe UT app. Mm -hmm. And what it has is you can either, we're, we're rolling this out in all of our schools, and you can, the students can use the app to text the crisis line, to chat with them, or they can just hit the button to call. There's a third option where they can um, report uh, it's a, t a tip line, so if there's a, a bullying issue or a, uh, a weapon in a school, they can report that. Um, I, is, uh, is Tori Yates here? Yeah, okay. So Tori uh, is with the University of Utah Institute of Neuropsychiatry that staffs these um, helplines. And how many calls do we get on a month, on average, between our crisis lines and our, our app? Uh, about 5,000 calls a month. About 5,000 calls a month. Keep in mind, Utah, we have less than 1% of the population of the country, so that's, for us, that's a, that's a lot. And the number is just spiking. So looking at ways through technology that is no cost to reach the you know, students and adults, we're finding huge success with. Um, another area, yeah. Um, another area that we're working on is a three-digit statewide crisis line. So we have 911, we have 211, you can dial another number for your gas line, you know, if you're going to dig. Well, we don't have one for crisis, and in terms of getting that out there, the, the, this is where federal and state kind of comes together because um, there's certain numbers that have been allocated and it's kind of difficult to find one that'll work, but it's, it's doable. And then anybody can text that line or call it. And then from a marketability perspective, you're not out there trying to you know, get people to remember 1-800, you know, I can't even tell you what the number is. <laughs> so um, that's an area that we're going. Another area I'm looking at is trying to provide funding for um, 
advertising, you know, billboards, internet, to uh, promote the crisis lines and all the different resources that are out there for help. Because if people don't know about it, they, they can't benefit from it. Um, a bill that I ran last session that was thanks to Tina. Um, I, interestingly, I had two um, firearms lobbyists approach me about running the bill after they'd visited with Tina. And I didn't have to think twice about that when they approached me and said, we have a suicide prevention bill for you. And so I opened up a bill file. It was really late in our session. We have one of the sh shortest sessions in the, in the country. And the bill passed the House unanimously and then just ran out of time in the Senate. But that's the, the gun shop bill that will provide uh, financial incentives and training material to uh, gun ranges, uh, firearm stores to educate their employees and uh, you know, watch for those customers that maybe are not buying it for you know, the, the proper purpose. And so we had great success with that, but we just ran out of time. So that'll definitely, I already have the bill file open up for next session. And based on the success that they've had, I think it's New Hampshire mm -hmm. and some other states, I'm, I'm looking forward to that definitely being another piece of our puzzle. Well, there's some wonderful ideas here, so I hope you're all taking notes. And Christine, before we jump to how to be a great state advocate, do you want to make a few comments? Well, just, um, again, where, where my head goes with all of this is that certainly there's the relationship between you and your constituents. There, for other representatives who are not as knowledgeable that suicide can even be prevented or that there are, are um, strategies that are known to be effective, I think that's a key message to bring to your representative to make sure that they feel like this isn't a futile kind of situation. Because I think you can get overwhelmed if you don't think there's anything um, that can be done. Um, I guess the main point I want to make is that in all of these bills and legislative activities they're talking about, there's a potential for AFSP to not only be involved in that process, but then to be the supplier of the product, of the resource that can be implemented. And that also could make their pathway to, um, to take action more just um, easier, because if you have something ready to go. So be in communication with us if we don't have those resources developed. That's, that's, we always want to hear from you about that. Definitely. So I hope people learned yesterday in your visits, if, especially if it was your first time, that people in capitals and state houses are just like us, you know? They have uh, family issues, they have problems, they have challenges they see and identify. And so I wanted to ask Tina and Steve just to identify, um, just to give us a little, a little advice about um, how to be a good advocate, what to come and say to them, and how to be supportive as this process goes along. One, you know, that's our job is to respond to emails, to phone calls. And the first thing I would encourage you to do is get to know your state reps before session, you know, um, to call them, reach them, have coffee with them. Maybe you'll see them in, in other settings if you work in the political world. But it's good for you to know who they are and for them to see you as a resource. Mm -hmm. um, I also, I, I'm not an attorney, but there, there's always my attorney friends say, never ask a question that you don't know the answer to. So when you're talking to a legislator, you know, it's not just raising awareness, you really should have in mind what the solution is. And um, I always encourage people to have their two minute elevator speech ready, which is kind of what we do also. Uh, why is this a compelling issue, right? Um, you know, what is the data telling us? Uh, what's the personal story and how are we gonna move forward? Uh, even working with the Second Amendment NRA that Steve was mentioning, the biggest thing they thought is it wasn't preventable. Why do anything? And so often legislators have that belief, like, you know, they're kind of overwhelmed by this issue um, and they don't know what the next step is. And so when I'm sitting there, and, and a lot of us, we have appointments every 10 minutes once we get in session. I mean, it's boom, boom. It's like, what's the issue? Can we solve it? Is it viable? How much is it going to cost? I mean, those are the kind of questions that are going through our brain when we talk to people. And I think it's that sense of urgency that really has helped us move so much legislation. And I think that's where your stories come in. Um, you know, one of the, the data pieces that was compelling on uh, the requirement for the doctors and nurses is that 60% of all the people that um, die by suicide saw a family physician within 30 days of taking their life. Mm -hmm. That was a pretty powerful statistic that a lot of advocates came and talked about, and they said, you know what, but there's something we can do. 
we know that training and knowledge, you know, is going to give them the tools they need to make those early interventions. And so again, it's, it's taking maybe a powerful piece of information and figuring out how to convey that to the legislature. And if you, if you bring paper with you, make it one page. We like simple, we like graphics, I mean, we, we get so inundated by so much information. So we, we kind of need you to kind of really focus in on what are the key pieces we need to know and what are the key strategies. Um, the budget pieces are always um, challenging. Uh, when we did our training bill, there's continuing education credits, so we actually didn't have a big fiscal note because we required it within training. If your state doesn't have that, it gets a little bit more challenging because then you're looking for additional dollars. But trying to figure out all those pieces, and that's where that stakeholder group or your, your organization comes in, is that you work through some of those issues uh, when you're engaging the legislators. Steve, before you start, I just want to remind you, if you have questions, please put them on the index cards and um, we'll collect them. So go ahead, Steve. Yeah, thank you. Um, so I'll kind of echo what Tina said also. Get to know your state representative and your state senator. And I would like to say that's more than just, um, oh, I sent you an email. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to give you an example of somebody in my district that has been a very good advocate for his profession. He's an anesthesiologist. And when I first ran for office, he said, you can put a sign on my lawn. Um, I'll go out and pass out flyers for you. Um, helped with a little campaign contribution. And occasionally, he shows up at the Capitol in his lab coat and says, oh, is there, I have a bill I'd like to talk to you about. <laughs> and it was any constituent, I'd say, I'd be happy to visit with you. Um, so I, I actually know some, a, 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 a fellow elected official once told me that when they get contacted by somebody, they look up in their database to see if that person is number one, their constituent, meaning lives in their district per se, and number two, if they are a registered voter. And the person told me if they are not, if they, if my little database doesn't tell me they, they actively vote, I really don't spend much time with them. Now I'm just, I'm just telling you that's a practical side of politics that you may not see. So, I mean, this doesn't, it doesn't matter what party you are. Every state has kind of different balances of power. But whatever, you know, party you affiliate with, get to know, you know, your people. And even if you live in a district that your rep maybe doesn't align with your political views, get to know them anyway. You can tell them, I'm a constituent. You don't have to tell them I'm registered with the other party. You just say, I'm a constituent, and I vote, and I'm open-minded. So, 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 so the, number one, get to know your reps. And then number two, be prepared to share stories. And I, I'll give you a couple quick examples. My, one of my first bills um, on suicide prevention, I was having a big floor debate, and I was, I was getting beat up pretty bad over the issue. And we had a rep hit his button, and our, our, our late speaker uh, told the story that there's a whole bunch of lights on to speak. And he, he stood up and he said, you know, I was here at the Capitol a few years ago, and I got a phone call that I needed to come to the hospital immediately because my son had made an attempt on his life. And he said, I didn't make it to the hospital in time, but if this bill passes, maybe people will avoid having those phone calls. Mm -hmm. And the speaker said, all of the lights turned off on the dais for people wanting to speak because the story was so powerful. We heard last night Senator Reed talk about sharing the story about his father, uh, yet another powerful story. Um, one of the most powerful um, people, and the reason I'm here today is a lady named Taryn Aiken with AFSP. <laughs> Uh, Taryn comes to every hearing, every bill presentation, <laughs> and shares her story and shares it with, with passion and fervor, and almost always we get it through unanimously. So lastly, have action items when you go to talk to your reps and senators. Say, here's legislation that has worked in other states. I would encourage you to, to, to sponsor legislation in our state. I was just talking to Nicole Gibson, and on AFSP's public policy website, there's a list of model legislation, which I understand is being improved and revamped, and so you'll be able to you know, refer them to exact you know, legislations passed in other states. Thank you. That's great. Do we have questions coming up to us? I thought I saw some being collected. Christine, you want to throw anything in before we go to questions? No. I'll okay. reserve right. the time okay. for that. Thank you. Um, I will say in the Massachusetts State Senate, um, we got our state suicide prevention plan passed when a state senator um, stood up and um, 
revealed that he had recently lost his brother. And then several, a um, couple years later, he also, um, he was actually on the cover of Newsweek magazine because he revealed that he himself suffered from depression in the wake of his brother's suicide. And he was so nervous about getting um, his prescription medication in his own district that he would drive an hour and a half away to pick it up. And he was tired of it. He came to a state suicide prevention conference. You could see him decide at the podium. He took his jacket off, rolled up his sleeves, and told the entire story. That, that made the path for us. It was definitely a game changer. Um, how do I, Steve, this is for you, how do I find the programs for suicide prevention being used in Utah schools? Are they available online or? Um, one of the programs that is, I think, our most popular, if you, if you go to, just Google Hope for Utah, uh, the number four, and you'll find an example of that one. And just in 30 seconds, that program, what they do in school, it's a peer support system, and they ask students the first you know, week of school, if you were in a crisis or depressed, who would you talk to? Listen names. They collect those names, they call those students in and say, you've been selected by your peers as somebody to look up to. Would you like to be part of a HOPE squad? And then they train them on you know, crisis outreach and how to be a resource and when to refer these students to counseling. And those programs have just taken off. And so that's just one example. Um, I'm gonna leave business cards up here on this table Great. and feel free to, my cell phone and email address, feel free to contact me personally and I can point you to some of the things we've been doing. So this is interesting. Um, I think, Tina, you mentioned about um, working with pharmacists. Um, what is being done or what do you feel can and should be done about easy access to prescription medications as a means of suicide? It's probably a complex problem. It is a complex issue. and. One of the reasons that we brought everyone to the tables is, one, I wasn't going to have a bill that had the word firearm in it. And so it, we put lethal means, and we decided when we ran a bill that it would be both pharmacy and um, the gun ranges and shooting ranges all in one bill. And the pharmacies, um, they were pretty eager to come to the table, uh, and they actually agreed to the training. And it really did strike me that they kind of realized they're an important part of this equation. And our, my bill on uh, requiring physicians, um, one of um, the senators stood up and said her husband had been depressed. He went to the doctor and he got a prescription for benzodiazepines and he got it filled and he took his life. And um, so we knew the pharmacy piece was gonna be important. We brought in the boards, which are really important, and all the organizations with the pharmacies. And they really were our front door and then now we have two groups under Safer Homes. One is a group of pharmacies. Um, we have the big chains, we have the small local chains that will be part of what messages are created that will go into the pharmacies. And they're gonna help us with our next steps. And we know there'll be a number of them and we wanted them to help design that, just like we are doing on the firearm side. Exactly, because they don't wanna sell medications that people are gonna use to die by suicide, definitely. Um, with bills requiring certain actions such as training, have you encountered pushback in terms of increased exposure to civil liability? And if so, have you managed to deal with that risk? Um, and then there's a more detailed question, but that's an interesting issue. What is the liability on training? We actually put specific language to protect disciplines against liability. And that did come up pretty quickly when the legislation was introduced. And, um, Luckily, we have a lot of great attorneys that we were able to kind of work through what was the right language to pr protect disciplines that train. Does that come into that, Steve? Um, I, I haven't encountered that a lot, okay. but the one thing I would say is that putting um, kind of good Samaritan clauses yeah. in there would be a critical yeah. part. Yeah. Yeah. Christine? Nancy, I have a related question oh, that came to me. Um, so thank you for sharing this question. She writes, four days prior to my husband's death, he saw a psychologist and was to be placed on suicide watch. Rather, she released him and he killed himself. How can we prevent this? What can we do? So this is what we're getting at in terms of clinician training. So, so here's, here's the mixed bag. On the one hand, the science, no matter how much training we do today, we may have better science soon, because we're funding a big study to, to answer the question about short-term risk and being able to predict or at least identify those who are really at higher risk in the short term. But right now, even if you get training, this unfortunately could still happen, and that's the sobering news. 
The good news, though, is that right now, so few healthcare providers are even trained in the basics about how to take it seriously, how to connect the dots, and, um, and what to do in, in the short term, as well as the follow through with referrals to specialty care and um, making access to care real and more available. So there's a huge, huge swath of work that needs to be done, and we will save lives by doing it, but, but unfortunately, probably not every life until we have the ability to, to be a little more um, fine-tuned in the clinical approach, especially in terms of short-term risk. Can, go. Go ahead, can I build on that? When we did the training bills, you know, I had physicians and psychologists approach us and said, you know, we're worried to ask because we don't have the tools, right? So it's not that people weren't sitting in their offices that were struggling with this. I think there was actually a fear of asking the fundamental questions. And so I think that's why the training is so important. And then we had to figure out the partnerships. How do we connect more resources? We're moving towards a lot of integrated care in our state where we'll have more mental health folks you know, in primary care and, and we're, we're moving towards the better models. But the first thing we had to do with physicians and all the range of professionals is make them comfortable asking the questions and figuring out what to do next because I think a lot of um, people were coming from help and, and not um, really having that provider be comfortable asking what they needed to ask. So Steve, it looks like your app might be popular. <laughs> how, how can we create an app like the Utah app? My college is in desperate need of something of that kind of that great resource. Great question. Um, the good news is, is the app is really simple. It's not uh, difficult to develop because it's really just a link to a phone number and then you know the technology to be able to text back and forth. Mm -hmm. The school component, um, I think I mentioned, gets routed directly to the school, so they take care of those items directly. Um, I, I would, uh, kind of lessons learned, I would work with, um, if it is a college, I'm mm -hmm. sure they've got a computer science department, mm -hmm. have them develop the app, it's very simple. I wouldn't go out necessarily and buy one, right. Right. Um, because the value in the app is gonna be how you promote it. Mm -hmm. As you roll it out to the schools, um, I was just in my son's high school the other day, and I walked in, the first thing I saw was a great big poster about the Safe UT app. And, um, and then um, our, 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 a lot of our people have gone out to promote this at, um, we had a, a comic con, a comic kind of convention in town that's always very popular. We had a booth there and gave out you know, thousands of the cards about the app. And so it's getting the technology in place and then getting funding out there to promote it is, is the key. Sounds great, thank you. Um, this is interesting. What advice do you have for a new AFSP chapter who may be a little bit late to the game in our state's coalition's councils for suicide prevention? How would you recommend this new chapter join the efforts uh, to get a seat at the table? It's a little bit like what you said earlier, right. I think, getting to know people and bringing information and. And you know, I think if I was in the beginning stages, I would be looking at um, your legislators and see who are natural champions. You might look to your health care committees. Uh, you might have committees on mental health. And I would try to find someone you think has done interesting work or has a background that might be interested in this work to start teaming up. And um, then you could be part of the initial actually building the stakeholder group, which I think is incredibly exciting to, to kind of be in that beginning stage. I, I, would, I would echo yeah. the same. Yeah. Yep. And, and, and one thing to keep in mind is that legislators turn over pretty quickly. So even if your chapter's new, yeah. you have to constantly be rebuilding relationships. So I wouldn't be discouraged because even you know, a hundred year old chapter may have uh, to rebuild right. those true. relationships. This is true. So in Massachusetts, we got the, the teacher, the school personnel training bill passed, only we didn't realize that in order to get it actually implemented, it had to be funded. Mm -hmm. So then we went back <laughs> because the school superintendent said, well, if you're going to do training, that means we have to pay those teachers for those two hours. So, oh, duh, Nancy, why didn't I think of that? So I'm going to use your school superintendent line. I'm going to go back and go to the, to the administrators and say, okay, you can be exempt if you can say you don't need it. So. And, and one thing we did in Utah is we said you have to have so many hours of continuing professional education. Yes. Yep. This just needs to be part of it. So it's yes. not incremental. It's not, it's, yeah, right. Basically, yeah. yep, two hours every five years, I think. We wanted three, but we compromised. Yeah, so <laughs> anyway, um, good advice all around. Um, here's a really um, 
this is a heartfelt question. I struggle back at home on boundaries in speaking to state and local pol policymakers specifically, whether I'm speaking as a law survivor and per with my personal opinions versus as an AFSP public policy person. What advice do you have so I feel confident? You know, I always say that um, data helps us write good policy bills, but it's the stories and the heartfelt messages that allow us to pass legislation. And I think, um, you know, we usually have, I think, about 3,000 bills introduced, and we have about 300 that become law. And it really is about sharing that compelling reason in a way that allows us to go back and share that with the legislators. That we need this bill, and we need it now, and here's why. And so, you know, I think you need to share what you feel comfortable with. I, I always want to make sure someone doesn't feel traumatized or hurt by the process. But I find a lot of the survivors I work with feel empowered. Mm -hmm. And when we're at that bill signing uh, and they bring in their entire family, it's part of their healing process. And so I hope that's what you'll experience as well. That's great. Steve? I think the thing I'd emphasize, I mentioned earlier, is finding the area of common ground. Um, you know, you can work with somebody who you may have huge differences of opinion on, on other areas, but if you just focus on, let's agree on this issue, because as I mentioned last night, it's not just bipartisan, it's nonpartisan. And when people come together on that common ground, and again, you can share the stories, share specific policy examples. If you just go to your representative, your senator, and say, you need to do something. Well, we hear that, as Tina said, every 10 minutes from somebody. And as much as we want to, we just don't have the bandwidth to do that. But if you come and say, you know, they passed a bill in Washington or Utah or Massachusetts that did this, and here's the results they saw of that, and I think that could benefit, you know, the people of our state, your constituents, our families, I think that's when you're going to start getting traction. Great. I, I, I mean, I use some of uh, Tina's bill to talk to a legislative committee in Massachusetts. So it, it really gives, it seems to bring a strong validity to your argument when you say another state is actually doing it. And sometimes you get to say you get to be the first, which yeah. is exciting too. <laughs> yeah. But you know, we do, one of the first things we do on a bill is we research what other states do. Yeah. We're really competitive with Oregon, so we always have to do something before <laughs> Oregon, but um, <laughs> that can be competitive with Utah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it looks like you're a leader to me, so. Um, this is interesting. It's probably too early to say, but have you seen that the rate of suicide has been affected since any of the legislation has been instituted? Um, I went to a seminar a few years ago, and I found out that uh, New York, after they put a statewide suicide prevention coordinator in place, after a couple years saw a 10% decrease in their level of suicides. And so I asked, I'm like, who's our statewide prevention coordinator? <laughs> we didn't have one. <laughs> so we ran a bill to create that statewide uh, director, uh, whose her name now is Kim Meyer. She's doing a fabulous job. And we also created a position in our state office of education, Kathy Davis, who's doing a phenomenal job because youth suicide in Utah is our number one cause of death for 10 to 17 year olds. So we wanted to put special emphasis on that. Um, so um, anyway, hopefully yeah. that's. Uh, yeah. And I think a lot of our interventions are systemic and we are going to be looking carefully at it. What happens on the licensure is people have a certain period of time to take the training. It's like during your licensure period, it might be two years, three years for doctors, it's six years. And so we have all these people titrating through training. And so even last year, we started having all of our counselors and you know, I'm talking to the trainers and now they're getting into the thousands of people, but it does take time to implement these laws. And so I think we have to be a little bit patient too of figuring out how all these pieces come together, but we do watch it really carefully and that is one of the things we're gonna look at it as a state. Um, one yeah, quick thing, it, it, two, two years ago we saw our first dip in 10 years in our total number of suicides. Oh, great. So right. it's, it's hard, it's, it's a, yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's a, obviously a very, uh, collaborative effort, and it's hard to say exactly why, but that was a good sign. Good sign, and we'll, we have to take the long view, but um, it's very encouraging. Um, something, um, sometimes in working as advocates, we come, we bump up against other organizations or coalitions that fall apart. Um, do you have any advice for those situations? I, I was in one in Massachusetts recently where a coalition against suicide prevention had made a recommendation about a budget, a line item amendment, and another organization not to be named. Um, 
jumped out of the coalition and got a legislator to sponsor their um, line item increase. It was a bit awkward. Don't want to involve the legislators in that kind of situation, but I'm sure you've seen that before. Or no, maybe you haven't. <laughs> I, I did have one interesting situation. I had a, uh, a group of pediatricians that wanted to help on a bill I was running for. Um, actually, I have one here in my pocket. Cable-style gun locks, oh. where these were distributed uh, to all of our youth protection seminars in all of our schools, in emergency, room de emergency departments and hospitals. And this group that wanted to help with this legislation um, they had done some things to maybe alienate uh, mm -hmm. some of the uh, firearms lobbyists. And so I told him, I said, well, the best way you can help me is just to sit on the bench on this one. Okay. So, so yeah. sometimes yep. just letting yep. them know exactly how they can help and yep. that may just be uh, taking a breather. And I think sometimes people do come in with different strategies. Of course, I'm not the only legislator. There's a lot of great legislators I work with. And sometimes people will be like, well, you know, on the school thing, they wanted everyone trained. And it's like, you know, I don't think I can do that in one session, mm -hmm. right? I think we can get this far. And so sometimes it's just really trying to bring people to the table. I have to do that with my legislative colleagues. We try to be on the same page. You can get all of us, you know, doing different things. but. We're going to have much more success if we come together. So I do try to get those conversations. Sometimes maybe there's different bills. Um, as legislators, we'll sit down and figure it out if the community can. But it's better if you come to us and you've been able to kind of connect yeah. and, and organize. Because the more united your message is, the better chance you have for success. Great. That's great. I'm going to let everyone say a few closing words so that we can move on to the next uh, event. But Christine, do you want to start? Well, this has been really informative and inspiring to me. I actually have some new steps I can take in my state <laughs> of New Jersey. Um, I actually wanted to just dovetail with something you just said, Tina, and it's a kind of a funny moment to do it, but um, the mo majority of people in the room just yesterday have been sharing some of your personal stories, perhaps, as part of your, um, your meetings on the Hill. And I so appreciated that you said, you know, share what you're comfortable with. Just in some conversations, it became clear to us that we're all at different places with our experience of loss, where we are in that grief process, um, or our own lived experience, and what that opens up for us when we start talking about it um, with strangers or just in public. And so I just wanted to take a moment to just say, um, you know, if it stirred things up a bit for you, just be mindful of that. and. Don't, don't just move on. Take a moment to just reflect on that and think about what you might need um, to make sure that you're, you're just as strong or maybe even stronger in the next moment, because that's what can happen in this process. And obviously, we're here for you as well if you need to um, you know, just talk about what that's like. We're, we're learning from each other as we go along in this process, actually, and it helps us in our planning of programs and the development of resources, especially on the lived experience side of things. So just want to say that. Steve? Um, yeah. <clears throat> um, th they're one of my favorite sayings is that um, the uh, man or woman who says it can't be done is interrupted by the man or woman who's, who's doing it. <laughs> and so you're going to hear a lot of people say, oh, you can't do that. It's too complex. Well, if you believe it, you can achieve it. And working together as a team is critical. Um, in Utah, we use a lot of times the acronym TEAM. Together, everyone achieves more. And sometimes that means surrounding ourselves with people who we may not agree with. But let's just find those areas that we can agree with. Two really quick uh, sports analogies. You miss 100% of the shots you don't take. And um, <laughs> so it, it relates to legislation. And going out there, if you go out and approach your representatives or senators and say, I'd like you to do this, the worst they can say is no. You miss 100% of the balls you don't swing at. So you, you believe you can make a difference, and you can. You know, I get to work on a lot of really important issues, but there's nothing that shaped me and um, that I'm more proud of um, than working on this issue. There is a sense of urgency. You know, I think there is a movement, and I'm so glad you, you're part of it in helping our nation. And so thank you. And I just really hope that you do find those partnerships. I'm really 
gives me hope to be here today and be with you on this issue. And I do think, you know, as, as long as we keep coming back together, I think we can get a lot done. So, thank you. so let's thank um, Steve and Tina. And I hope you find a Steve and Tina in your state.